In today's scratch cooking video, I've got some healthy budget meals for family. You'll find chapters below this video if you'd like to bounce around to different recipes. Hey there, I'm Shayla, an earthy mountain mama and a happy homemaker wife. Thank you for being here. We have a homeschool family of eight and two to four times a month I share a video here with wholesome scratch cooking, homemaking, homeschooling, and homesteading, and a short, sweet devotional with hopes of being a light in this dark world. I am no spring chicken like so many similar YouTubers, but what I do have is over 30 years experience in many of the things that I share here at this channel. We would love to have you come along and join us here, so hit that subscribe button if you'd like to see videos like this more often. Sometime around November last year, my husband found a good deal on some turkey breasts. So I started thinking of what I could do with them that was creative and I decided to try hot turkey sandwiches. I want the turkey breast to have a smoky flavor. So I've got some smoked applewood sea salt here and I've got a little bit of Wright's liquid smoke seasoning as well. Turkey is one of those foods that's usually pretty affordable, but if it's not cooked right, it's not that good. And of course with a turkey breast, it can dry out very quickly. I am taking the sea salt, that applewood smoked sea salt, and some poultry seasoning, and I am putting it underneath the skin or between the skin and the meat. This helps to season the meat more deeply. I've got some cloves of garlic. I'm gonna slice and slip in here, and then I'm going to cover it with parchment paper, including the lid. So I, I want this thing to stay extra, extra moist. That's why I'm putting the parchment paper over the top to help hold in some more of that moisture. And my lid doesn't fit on here, so I'm gonna have to use some foil to top it with. Next, I'm gonna slow roast this thing in my wood cook stove. This thing is airtight. It makes the absolute most moist and wonderful meats. So this turkey is gonna roast at about 200 degrees, and over here, I'm going to start another dish. I am gonna make some chicken pot pies. These are going to be roasted in the wood cook stove as well. I am putting a nice sear all over the outside of this chicken. This is a little trick that worked really well. I'll be doing it again. It definitely helped to seal in more moisture in the chicken. I'm keeping the seasonings traditional and super basic. This is poultry seasoning. I've also got some celery tops that I dehydrated from our garden last year. These are so full of flavor and so good. And parsley salt. This is also from our garden. I absolutely love growing our own herbs and spices. I feel like they have so much more flavor than most store-bought. Putting about a tablespoon of salt here, just over the top of the birds. I did not show it, but I did put a quart of chicken broth in here as well. It's time to cover these and pop them in the wood cook stove. They're gonna roast at about 200 degrees or a few hours or until they're falling apart. In my last video, my kids and I made some Julia Child dishes, and so over here we have some leftover beef bourguignon, but it's not quite enough to feed the whole family. I'm gonna tell you guys a little trick that is so good to do with your leftover roasts, or roast beef. Shred up the beef and serve it over pasta. It is just the most wonderful, hearty comfort food, especially topped off with some Parmesan cheese, kind of like an elevated spaghetti, I guess you could say. And over here, the chicken is done. It, it is cooked to perfection. It's moist and falling off the bone. Here's the broth. I'm gonna be setting this aside and working on my vegetable base for the pie. So I'm gonna start with mincing up some shallots and I'm gonna saute some finely sliced carrots and onions. And of course, we're gonna need some more garlic over here. I can't have enough garlic. I've got my chicken all shredded and ready to go. I'm adding some dehydrated onion tops from my garden last year to the vegetable base. These add so much flavor to pretty much everything. <laughs> and here I have dehydrated celery, um, again, also from the garden. I have so much trouble finding dehydrated organic celery, so I gave up looking for it and I started growing and dehydrating my own. Part of the reason I did that is because when I buy celery, I'll use a couple stalks, but then the rest always goes bad before I can use it. And I discovered that with dehydrated celery, I wouldn't have to worry about that it wouldn't go bad and it will always be there ready waiting when I need it. <laughs> These are our homegrown organic potatoes so I do not throw away the peels. These are like gold. Potato peels are so full of nutrition. 
and flavor, so I cook them into my stocks and soup broths when I'm making them. My mirepoix is ready and delicious, and over here, the turkey is done. You guys, this was cooked to perfection. The most moist turkey I have ever made. <laughs> and this is gonna make the best hot turkey sandwiches. Since they are gonna be hot turkey sandwiches, I undercooked it ever so slightly because they're going to be heated up again. And I'm setting them aside for another day and I'm gonna start my base for the chicken pot pies. I took those chicken carcasses, onions, the potato peels, garlic and more seasonings, and I cooked them up in my instant pot and made a wonderful broth that I'm going to use for the chicken pot pie base. I'm gonna strain out all of that beautiful, gorgeous broth now. Since I did this in the instant pot, it didn't take very long and these bones are falling apart. Now I'm not gonna throw all of this away. This is the scraps from the broth. I'm going to put it in my food processor and make a paste out of it. Now this will not work and it can be dangerous if the bones are not falling apart, but as you can see here, these bones are literally disintegrating in my hands. So next I'm gonna run this through my food processor until it's all super finely chopped and it's basically gonna turn into a paste. And this is gonna make a delicious and nutritious treat for this furry little friend over here. Now I'm gonna melt a couple cubes of butter and I'm gonna make kind of a thick roux gravy sauce. So I've got my broth back here getting ready to boil. I happen to notice I've got a little bit of extra mirepoix. So I'm gonna take a little bit of this aside and I'm gonna just mix up some really quick clam chowder. This ended up being some of the best clam chowder I've ever made. I literally just took some chicken pot pie gravy and this extra mirepoix and I opened up a can of clams for each jar. Super simple, super easy. And to make the gravy, I have got a cup of melted butter here and I'm going to add a cup of gluten-free flour. I have about a full gallon of chicken broth. You can see it back there boiling away. I like to have it super hot and boiling to make the whole process go much faster. A little secret ingredient I like to add to my roux sauce is either a half and half or a little cream. It gives the sauce so much more flavor and depth. Now I'm going to add my boiling stock. If this was not boiling, if it was like room temperature or just warm, I would be standing here for quite a lengthy amount of time waiting for this gravy to get thick and cook. By using the boiling broth though, it makes the whole process go much faster. The only thing is you have to be really on the ball and you have to have a very large whisk like I have. Stir rapidly, otherwise it will get lumps. It's made the most lovely, luxurious base for this clam chowder. I will have an alternative recipe at the end though. I love it when it works out to make multiple dishes from one base dish. So I'm making the chicken pot pie, but I'm able to make another spare dish off to the side. And it's actually possible to do this with soups quite often. Now it's time to add all the ingredients to the chicken pot pie gravy. I've got the peas, the chicken, I'm gonna add some corn and the mirepoix to this. Once you have everything all assembled, you definitely wanna make sure and taste test it, make sure it doesn't need more salt. Going for kind of a rustic flair tonight. And so I'm gonna use my cast iron pans to make these chicken pot pies. And I think it's gonna make them look really pretty. As I'm working on getting these assembled, my darling husband came into the kitchen to help and he got the egg wash ready, so he's putting that on. The last time I made chicken pot pies, the kids felt like it was too much crust, so we are leaving the bottom crust off on these. It's just gonna be the chicken pot pie mix and then the crust on top. We liked it a lot better this way. I have a few jars of leftover chicken pot pie base, so it looks like we'll have enough for a couple more dinners this week. This was exciting. It turned out so unbelievably good. I had a lot of chicken left over. So I mixed the chicken that was left over with some cheddar cheese, some cottage cheese, and a little sour cream. And what I'm thinking to do with these is save it for a lunch later this week. And I was thinking of maybe make some taquitos or quesadillas. I could kind of go either way with this. So I'm just adding some taco seasoning and getting this all mixed up so that it's ready to go for a fast and quick lunch during one of our homeschool days this week. So I lean on you when I've lost my way. I keep holding
I am so blessed with some older kids and they usually take care of breakfast. So I get a break in the mornings and it looks like this morning they decided to make some French toast. Mmm, good. Lately, I started doing something new with my chicken stocks and my beef stocks and broths. I started saving all of the organic onion peels to put in the broth while it's cooking and it adds so much color and another layer of flavor to the broths. I wouldn't do this if I was not using organic onions. So all of these peels or onion skins would be thrown in the trash and wasted since you can't actually eat them. But this is a really good way to use them up and reduce waste and make your broth for soups more delicious and nutritious. With the love divine, shine, shine. Next up are these hot turkey sandwiches. And hey, if you're wondering why is there a drill on my counter? If you're new here, you don't know this, but we live in an unfinished home that we are working to finish, which means there are a lot of areas that are under construction and there are constantly tools out in places where you wouldn't expect to see them. So I hope you'll excuse the construction messes that you'll see in many of my videos here. Okay, so I'm putting some sourdough bread into the oven for these sandwiches. I have a lot of experience with sourdough bread and I've really simplified the process. I've gathered all of my best tips together in a video called Sourdough Simplified. I'll link to it below for you. Our family used to have some issues with wheat and I'm not really supposed to have it at all but with sourdough it's different we can tolerate this and it's so healthy and doesn't affect our digestive systems negatively plus I save around $200 a month by making our own bread so for these sandwiches I have some provolone and some monster cheese I've got some roasted red peppers that I harvested from our garden last fall and I froze them and I think they'd be a really good addition on this. We're going to completely douse these things with some pepperoncinis. You could use mayonnaise on these, but I used hot turkey gravy. These are wonderful toasted or untoasted, either way, whichever you prefer. Sweet onions or red onions really set this sandwich off as well. I can see the glow from a love divine. Shine, shine.
In these scenes, it's a homeschool day, and I decided to make quesadillas with the taco chicken mix that I made the other night. If I had more time, I would probably make taquitos because the kids would have really liked that, but they're gonna like these quesadillas too. And since I am shorter on time, the quesadillas will be a lot faster. I've had some requests for fast lunch ideas for homeschool days, and this is definitely one of them. Our family is kind of picky about leftovers. Not everybody is crazy about them in our home, I'll, I'll be honest. <laughs> but if you're creative, you can come up with ideas like this where a dish is only partially cooked. And with something like this, it tastes fresh enough when you go to assemble it. I just sprinkled the cheese on these and I'm sprinkling some onions on now and I'm making a big mess. And I'll show you why in a second. I'm not worried about the mess. I grew up in a small family. It was just me and my brother and my parents. So as my family started to grow and expand, it took me a quite a bit of time to learn how to do, I'm not sure what you would call it, maybe mass production or assembly line preparing for lack of better wording. I've often thought it would have been awesome to have had a little bit of experience learning how to cook in a professional industrial sized kitchen because that would have given me a leg up on how to prepare food for a larger amount of people in an efficient way. <laughs> so you'll notice how I laid all of the quesadillas out and I just did the same thing. I streamlined it and I got them all topped and I didn't worry about making a mess. Part of the reason why is I have this scraper here. By not worrying about keeping all the toppings perfectly on each little quesadilla by just basically tossing it on there and slapping it on. I probably cut the production time on these down by 15 minutes at least. And once I got down to my last few quesadillas, I could just take the bench scraper or the countertop cleaner and scoop all of those leftover ingredients on, put them on that last quesadilla and voila. Another thing I learned is don't mess around with cooking. Get all the pans going. Don't dink around with just, you know, a couple pans. Get, get them all going. Just get it all done. It uses the same amount of electricity or gas, whatever your oven is. I really like things that are more industrial size, like this six burner stove. It used to take me about two hours to do things like make pancakes for my whole family. Well, with this stove, I can get it done in about 30 minutes or less. Something to consider is if you're a homeschool family, you're gonna be home, you're gonna be cooking with all of your tools and your kitchen gadgets a lot more often than an average family. So look into getting industrial equipment and tools that are made for the wear and tear. Otherwise, you're gonna be replacing your kitchen tools and your gadgets and the things that you need on a very regular basis and it's gonna nickel and dime you. So look for things with lifetime warranties and that are made to last. For today's devotion, I wanna talk about the importance of resting in the Lord. All my life, I've always felt like success in everything was up to me. I've always been an early riser, sometimes rising as early as one o'clock in the morning in order to work my part-time jobs and then be able to homeschool the kids in the daytime. Over the last few years, I've gotten kind of disheartened at times because it feels like I haven't seen the return in a lot of my ventures that mirrors the effort that I have put into some of them. And so I've been praying a lot about that lately and asking God for direction and just comfort and assurance that he loves me even though it doesn't feel like I've been able to be as successful in areas as I would like to be. One morning as I was praying about this, Psalms 127 to impressed me. The verse reads, it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. This reminded me of the verse in James 4 where it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Got nothing to worry about when you're by my side. This morning, I slept in. I turned 40 a few years back. And once I turned 40, it was almost like a light switch went off and everything changed. I've always been an early riser and I believe that it's a good practice to get up early when you're a homemaker and homeschooling. 
However, I believe in balance and I think it's what is most important is that you really listen to your body. If you're in a season where you have sleepless nights with babies or if you're in like the season I'm in where your body is telling you to slow down and you're having health issues, you need more sleep. <laughs> so it's really important to listen to your body and if you need extra sleep in the morning, don't worry so much about following some strict rule and get up early every morning. So when I get up later, I get up and then I usually do my devotions at around one o'clock. And I mean one o'clock in the afternoon. But obviously this morning I didn't have time to do my makeup or my hair. <laughs> which is okay, it happens sometimes. In fact, when it comes to makeup, I usually don't wear makeup. I usually just try to emphasize a really good skincare routine. So I do my skincare routine in the morning and every night, I try to. I found though that if you take really good care of your skin, you don't need to wear as much makeup. For those of you out there that make your own bread, I know you're gonna appreciate this. I found a dough washcloth. It works really well for cleaning up the sticky bread dough. These things do a fantastic job of washing off dough and sticky flour from surfaces. And the best part about it is that it's easy to wash the dough out of the washcloth when you're done. But they don't just work great for cleaning up sticky dough. They work great for all kinds of things. I love these washcloths because they're a lot more sanitary than um, you know, a traditional regular washcloth. We're still enjoying and have so many delicious potatoes from last year's garden that we have been eating. And so I've been trying to think of new creative recipes and I found a quite a few fun potato recipes in Julia Child's cookbooks. So for this recipe, I've got about three pounds of potatoes and I have diced them up. I'm going to simmer them just for a few minutes in this broth, just to get them tender. I'm not gonna cook them all the way. Once they're tender and have cooked for about 10 minutes, I'm going to take them out and then I'm going to use the broth to make a sauce. One of the things I love most about French cooking is the sauces. I absolutely love sauce on pretty much everything. <laughs> this recipe is a gratin and it requires a thick roux sauce made with the broth. And then to that, it calls for some beaten eggs. Next time I go to make this recipe though, I'm gonna leave the eggs out. I didn't like the eggs in this dish. By the way, you guys, really quickly, I wanna say the lighting in my kitchen is funky. I feel like it's way too harsh in areas. So I have been learning lately that in a kitchen, you're supposed to have three different kinds of lighting. You're supposed to have your work surface lighting, which I do not have, your walkway lighting, which is currently the only lighting that I have, <laughs> and then you're supposed to have ambient lighting. After filming this video and being so displeased with the lighting, I decided to research all of that good stuff. So after this video, I started working on the lighting in my kitchen and looking at some ways to add more work surface lighting. So I'm hoping that in future videos the lighting will be drastically improved for your viewing pleasure. This whisk might look like overkill to most people out there but the thing is is that if you do a lot of cooking or if you're a large family and of course do a lot of cooking <laughs> this is actually one of the most wise investments I think I've made in quite some time. I have been through so many whisks just this week in one of the clips one of the whisks that I bought that came highly rated on Amazon. A lot of people loved it. The whisk was supposed to be really good and last a long time. And I'm sure like for use in like regular use, regular household use for, you know, smaller families that make far smaller quantities of food at a time and maybe don't make as much food, <laughs> might be great, but industrial. I think one of the biggest tips I can give to anybody that's planning to have a large family or um, maybe is getting started with our large family is just go for the gusto. Get the industrial sized. You will replace it like 20 times over if you go for the cheaper stuff, but if you get something that is made to last or at least made to like deal with a lot of wear and tear, like industrials, sized equipment and industrial equipment, um, it might last you and you might not have to replace it. I'm hoping I never have to replace this thing. I probably will because I use whisks all the time and I'm pretty hard on whisks. But I've been finding that the industrial items like this and then I've got a huge ladle too that I think I also used this week. Um, just 
so valuable in a large family mama's kitchen or a kitchen where a person does a lot of cooking industrial size. I'm making a Julia Child recipe tonight and I'm timesing it by three. So I'll put it into two con two dishes over here. One dish will be for us for tonight. The other dish will be for us tomorrow night. I never like to make just one meal at a time if I can make something and make like two or three. That's always a win situation because it means less I have to do tomorrow or the next day. Did I just put six in here or five? Six. My oldest son just came in and told me I used the wrong eggs in the dish. There were older eggs I was supposed to have used. Never thought I would get in trouble with my kid in the kitchen cooking. Okay, it says to drop the potatoes in boiling salted water. I did that, only I used broth. Cook for six to eight minutes or until they're barely done. Did that. Uh, I'm supposed to cook the onions slowly in butter. I didn't do that, so I gotta do that. I've got everything else ready. I'm making, it's called uh, Gratin de Palms de Terre. Terre, 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 Terre. Ox and chills. And chills. And chills. Got it. Let's see. Okay, so the recipe says I'm supposed to put half the potatoes down, then half the onions, then lay the anchovy fillets on the top, and the rest of the onions, and finally the remaining potatoes, and then pour the eggs and cream or the bechamel sauce over the potatoes and shake the dish to send the liquid to the bottom. They'll just layer the bechamel with, with the potatoes and everything. The only things I would have done differently in this dish or that I will do differently in the future is I would have used a different kind of cheese. The recipe called for Swiss cheese. I think cheddar would be better. And the only other thing I would have done is left the eggs out. I did not like the eggs in this dish as mentioned. Do like the anchovies, our family, most of us like anchovies, but I know that a lot of people do not like anchovies. So you could totally leave those out of this dish. I will say the combination of the anchovy, the eggs, and cheese and potatoes does make this a nice high protein omega rich dish that would be a really good brain food so it would be an excellent thing to have for breakfast in the morning to kind of feed your brain for the day my husband loves soups for his lunches especially this time of year when it's chilly outside so to finish off this video i am going to make one of his new favorites it's a clam chowder about a week and a half ago i was making some other recipes and i don't even remember what i was making anymore but i realized i had some extra ingredients and then i realized that if i mixed those extra ingredients with just a few other extra ingredients that I would have a really nice soup for my husband. Well, we took a bite of this whimsical soup that was kind of off the cuff and it was such a hit. So today I'm going to make more of it. We're gonna start out with three or four very large carrots and I'm going to slice them super thin like you see here. I've quartered these and now I'm just slicing them thin. And now we've got three onions. It's a lot, but they really make this dish. And we're gonna dice these up. You can dice them if you have people that don't like onions in the house or you can chop them like I did. Next, we're gonna start with sauteing our vegetables. I'm going to start with the carrots since they're going to take a little bit longer. If you're not making as large of a quantity as I am, like I've got five cups of carrots here. If you're making less for a smaller amount of people, you could probably do the onions and the carrots all in the same pan. So we're gonna saute these up. Hopefully you won't scorch some of yours like I did here. <laughs> Something I am not showing is the celery. So I have dehydrated celery that I harvested and dried from last year. So I'm not using fresh celery for this. You probably won't be using dried celery, so you would wanna use around 
three or four stalks of celery chopped. I wanted to show you guys this briefly. I started saving my onion peels in skins that are you know the dried ones on the outside they add so much flavor to soup stocks so don't throw them away use them while my onions are sauteing i am chopping up about 10 cups of potatoes but i'm not going to use all of these for this soup for the soup you probably only want maybe five or six cups of chopped potatoes and you can put more or less depending on your family's likes more potatoes will make the soup a bit thicker and creamier I am using two different kinds. I want some russets to add some nice creaminess and then I want the red potatoes because they're going to hold a little bit more of their form and I do want some chunks of potatoes but I also want the creaminess from the russets to thicken the soup. Over here I've got some helpers. I have been trying to teach my four oldest kids how to cook more dishes lately. These boys here, I've been working on teaching them how to make soups. Normally since our wood cook stove is going, I would cook these over on that but today I'm in a hurry and I do need these done more quickly. So I'm going to do them in the Instant Pot. I've got some celery salt here, and I'm also going to add a few more celery tops that I dehydrated. Next, I have got green onions. These are just regular green onion tops to add a little bit more of the onion flavor because it just really makes the soup, I feel like. I've got a tablespoon of salt I'm adding, and then garlic. I only have one clove here, but I do recommend putting in more cloves of garlic if you love garlic. I'm going to add just enough water to barely cover these because I don't want too much water in them. And I'm going to instant pot them for about 12 minutes. My carrots and onions are all finished and if we look inside the pan, we're going to see some brown bits. Apparently, this is called fond in French. This is what gives us that nice, deep, rich flavor to soups. I'm going to be adding about a gallon of chicken broth to this pan, and I'm going to deglaze and get all that fond off the bottom of the pan. I like to add a few bay leaves to pretty much every soup I make. At this stage of the soup, there are a couple different directions you could go. You could make a roux and just simply add your broth to that, or you could do it this way. And this is the way I'm doing it today. So I've got about one and three quarters cup of gluten-free flour here, and I'm mixing it into almost two cups of water. And this is what I'm going to give the soup a little extra creaminess with. Next, I'm going to add about one and one third cup of milk powder. My broth is boiling and so I'm just whisking the milk powder into the broth. You could add milk if you prefer. You wanna whisk this until the milk powder has disintegrated into the broth and you can't see any lumps. <laughs> Once this has come to a rolling boil, we can add our flour and water mixture. You don't wanna stop stirring after you add the flour and water mixture because this will get lumps that you will not be able to get out if you do. So you wanna keep stirring this until it comes to a rolling boil again. Once it comes to a rolling boil, just let it boil and stir for about a minute and then you can add a couple cups of cream. I like to use heavy organic whipping cream. At this point you can turn the heat completely off and then we can add our clams. I only have six cans of clams over here. It probably would have been better with closer to 10. A really important trick is you want to strain all of the clams and you want to add the clam juice to your soup, but don't add the clams until just before serving. Next I'm going to cook up some bacon over here. This really takes this clam chowder over the top and makes it so good. I have about maybe a pound and once it's cooked up, I'm gonna add it to the soup and then I'm going to start adding all of the ingredients. Now, <laughs> you're gonna see in a second here, I should have used a bigger stock pot. This one ended up not being big enough for the quantity that I was making.
done cooking. So at this point, I can add the clams. I don't want to add the clams until the soup, or you don't want to add the clams until the soup is entirely done cooking because if you cook it very long after you add the clams, the clams will get even more tough since they're already canned. Now, what I'll just be doing at this point is just reheating the soup. You could save the clams aside and add them even after the soup has been reheated, you know, as long as they're cooked clams, it won't matter. And that will keep the clams even a little bit more tender.